It is good to be with you again tonight. If you have any updates to the prayer concerns, I hope you will get in touch using the contact information that will be on the screen in just a few minutes. If you're listening on the phone tonight and don't have email access, I'd love to hear from you. My number at the church, the church line, is 608-224-0274. And remember, we're having two worship services every Lord's Day at 9 o'clock and also at 1030, and we're using Sign Up Genius to do that. If you have any trouble with that or need help signing up, uh, get in touch with me or with Kenna. But any updates to the prayer concerns, anything we need to be praying about, I would love to hear from you. In terms of good news tonight, I am thankful that last week's election went off with minimal drama. As election officials, our goal is to facilitate the right to vote and to make sure that every vote is counted accurately. And on Monday, we got a follow-up email from the city clerk's office congratulating our team on a job well done during some difficult circumstances. They threw in an extra award at us at the very last moment due to the pandemic. The other ward was across the street at a nursing home, which is obviously not ideal to have 2,900 of your uh, neighbors file through a, a nursing home like that. So they were thrown in with us at the very last moment. And so we had two very large wards voting at Chavez Elementary School on the southwest side of Madison. And in the email that went out to the chief inspectors this past Monday, I learned that our team of 30 handled more absentee ballots than any other polling place in the entire city of Madison, with more than 1,500 absentee ballots counted. We had two National Guardsmen helping with those absentees. They were a huge help, working for probably 15 hours straight, getting those uh, all squared away. And we also had a number of brand new poll workers, about probably 80% of my team had never done this before, which is a a challenge all of its own. You might have noticed through the years that we normally have a lot of elderly, a lot of retired people working at the polls. Well, that's the exact population that doesn't need to be interacting with the public like that. And so we've had a a younger crew than usual this time, and it it all worked out. Uh, By the way, when I went to vote, you know, kind of leading the way and kind of testing some of their uh, <laughs> some of their processes, I guess. When I stepped up, I realized I did not have my driver's license with me, and I always had my driver's license with me. I didn't have my photo ID. And so I called home, and Kaola found it zipped in the front pocket of my life jacket. I had gone kayaking a few weeks ago and took my ID out of my wallet, and I zipped it in my life jacket to help identify me if the authorities had to fish my body out of the Yahara River. And so uh, Wisconsin election law allows a digital picture of a photo ID, and so I had my wife take a picture of my passport from home and text that to me. And then I was able to train my team on one more way to get people to vote who might not have their ID on them at the polls at that moment. So anyway, it was a good day. We facilitated another election, which hopefully prepared us a little bit better for what is coming in November, which will surely be a large one. Tonight I am at Blue Mound State Park. As you can see, if you might be able to see, I'm near one of the two towers on top of Blue Mound. I've had a number of runners and hikers and families come by here tonight. I hope I don't look too strange, a little creepy over in the woods with a laptop and a and a huge light. But uh, it's been a, it's been a good night so far. The mosquitoes are about to start to find me, so if I get carried away, I uh, probably should have put the ID back in this pocket. Um, but anyway, the tower is closed because of the tandem, uh, pandemic. Apparently, towers spread viruses. Don't want a lot of people in one spot up there, so it's closed for the night. But uh, anyway, I'm here at the base of it. Blue Mound State Park is about 30 minutes straight west of Madison and at 1,719 feet. The West Blue Mound that we are on right now, this is in Iowa County. This is the highest point in the southern half of Wisconsin. The East Blue Mound, right over there, is about 200 feet lower than where I am right now. It's actually located in Dane County. So the county line uh, cuts through just a quarter mile over there, and it divides the East and the West Mounds. Uh, By the way, most of you may know, some of you may not, but the highest point in the state of Wisconsin is Tim's Hill, up in Price County at 1,951 and a half feet. (laughs) And so a little bit taller, a little bit higher than where where I am right now. But for the southern half of Wisconsin, this is our highest peak. If you want to call this a peak, I'm in front of this tower tonight because we are about to look at a passage 
where Jesus refers to building a tower. And we'll get to that toward the end of tonight's lesson. So tonight we're back to our study of Luke. By way of review, we know Luke is a Gentile. He's a medical doctor. He uses some medical terminology in his writing. We're going to see a little bit of that tonight. If I remember to mention that, we'll, we'll point that out. But he writes both Luke and Acts to a man by the name of Theophilus. And he makes a point of writing in chronological order. He also includes a number of people who were often overlooked and sometimes oppressed in the ancient world. Women and widows and Gentiles and Samaritans, as well as the sick, which he pays special attention to being a physician himself. Last week, we looked at Luke 13, where some people come to Jesus and they tell him about some kind of a massacre that Pilate carried out. And Jesus, of course, uh, turns that into a lesson on repentance. Not that those people deserve to die. That's not what was going on there. Uh, nothing like that. But he says, unless we repent, we will all likewise perish. And then we have the parable of the unproductive fig tree. And that's where I did last week's class from in front of our pear tree, which was very productive this year. And then we had the healing of the woman who had been bent double for many, many years. We had two short parables comparing the kingdom to a mustard seed and leaven. Uh, we had the discussion about the narrow door. Then at the end, we had the Pharisees warning Jesus about Herod wanting to kill him, which we might assume the Pharisees would have been in favor of. They were trying to kill him. Uh, but Jesus responds by calling King Herod a fox. So the Lord is not intimidated, not whatsoever. And he continues on his way to Jerusalem. So tonight we continue on with Luke chapter 14. So the first paragraph tonight is Luke 14 verses 1 through 6. Let's notice what happens. Luke 14, 1 through 6. It happened that when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. And there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silence. And he took hold of him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? And they could make no reply to this. First of all, it's a bit strange that Jesus goes into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees. Remember, the Pharisees have really turned on the Lord at this point. So they are no longer curious. Now they are actively opposing Jesus. They're no longer friendly. They aren't curious that they are actively working against him. Back in John 10, 31, that we looked at in chronological order a couple weeks ago during the Feast of Dedication, right before this in chronological order, you may remember that the Jews actually pick up stones. They were ready to stone Jesus to death, but he escaped from that situation. So there is, I would say, open hostility toward Jesus at this point. Nevertheless, Jesus ends up at the home of a leader of the Pharisees. It's probably pretty safe to assume then, especially based on what happens, that the Pharisees are pretty much setting a trap here. They're looking for a reason, and that's what we find at the end of verse 1. They are watching him closely. They are looking for an excuse to take him down. They're gathering evidence, and they're looking for a reason. And they find it, don't they? It's hard for us to uh, not imagine that this is a setup. This is obviously what's going on here. We're not told that it is, but that here's Jesus in the home of a religious leader on the Sabbath day. And this man, we're told, is suffering from dropsy. So it, it appears that they probably put this man there, or at least arranged the meeting, and dropsy, that's not a medical term that most of us are familiar with. And so we look it up in a Greek dictionary, and the word behind this word literally refers to an excess of water. An excess of water. The term is only used one time in the whole Bible, and it's used right here. And it's only used by Luke, who is a medical doctor. So this man is suffering from an excess of fluid in his body, which is interesting. Uh, because my mother-in-law has actually been hospitalized this week in Ohio for this exact reason. There may be various causes, but we know that if the kidneys aren't functioning as they should, fluid can accumulate, and it puts pressure on the heart, and of course then all kinds of terrible things can happen, and that's the, the case with her. Again, we don't know the cause in this man's life. We don't know what made him uh, have this condition. All we're told is that he's suffering from an excess of fluid, the meaning of the compound Greek word behind this word that we have here in the New American Standard as dropsy. I think some of the modern 
translations do a little bit better job. They, they go ahead and they say he was suffering from an excess of fluid. So if you're looking at a different translation, you may notice that they handle it a little bit better. But this is all we're told about his condition. We don't know uh, exactly what this meant for this particular man, but it seems to have been obvious to those who were observing. And so I'm assuming that he must have looked swollen, he must have looked uncomfortable, he must have looked miserable in some way. This was affecting the man in some obvious outward way. And so Jesus, seeing this, he speaks not to the man first, but notice he speaks to the lawyers and the Pharisees. And the Lord wants to know, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Well, it's interesting that Jesus doesn't just heal the man, but it, it's almost as if he's asking for their permission. He wants their opinion beforehand. They know he can do this. They've been watching him for three years now. They know he's capable of this. So they're, they're in quite the predicament here, aren't they? If they say, no, it is not lawful, well, obviously that puts them in the position of prolonging this man's suffering and losing any appearance of humanity and compassion in the eyes of the crowd. But if they say, yes, it is lawful, then they're basically inviting Jesus to do something amazing, while at the same time they are seen as not even enforcing their own rules for not working on the Sabbath day. And so from the Pharisees, the lawyer's point of view, there is no good answer here, is there? There's nothing good that can come from this the way they see it. No matter what they answer, it's bad for them. The best answer, of course, would be for them to repent for them to stop harassing Jesus, for them to confess Jesus as being the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. But in the absence of this, which they obviously refuse to do, they take the cowardly option here and they keep silent. They simply refuse to answer the Lord's question. Jesus then takes hold of the man and he heals him and he sends him away. I find it interesting that Jesus now doesn't have the man stick around for the aftermath. He doesn't have the man stick around for the argument that follows, but he sends him away. He heals them and then sends him on the way before getting into it with these men. This would obviously protect the man from the drama to follow. This is not his fight. This is between Jesus and the Pharisees. It's not about him. If you remember over in John 9, when Jesus heals the blind man, the Jewish leaders actually pull the blind man into court and they harass him. And then they also, if you remember, pull his parents into court and they harass the man's parents. And so this time, therefore, Jesus simply heals the man, sends him away, gets him out of there, and then he gets into it with the leaders. And so this question to the leaders points out an inconsistency with their hypocrisy. These men will help an ox. They will help an animal. They'll help one of their own children if they fall into a, a well on the Sabbath day. Uh, both of these are allowed on the Sabbath, according to God's law. It would be inhumane to see someone fall into a well and then refuse to help because of some man-made, made-up religious rule. We can't even picture that. It's hard for us to imagine that. Seeing somebody drowning in a well or suffering from a broken leg at the bottom of a well or whatever, while we stay up at the top looking down at them, refusing to work on the Sabbath day, that, I mean, that's just a, a heartless thing to do. That was never the intent of the Sabbath law. They had added to it, uh, making it mean something that it was never intended to mean by God in the beginning. Well, seeing that uh, the Pharisees and the lawyers probably see what Jesus is saying here, they have no answer for it. There's no defense for their position. Uh, plus, we can imagine that it would probably be a little bit difficult to argue with a man who can heal people like this. In my mind, I'm imagining a presidential debate of some kind where one of the candidates uh, raises somebody from the dead. It would be hard. It'd be hard to argue with something like that. It would be almost, almost impossible. The debate would be over at that point. So the, uh, the the end would come there, and that's basically what happens here. And this authority demonstrated uh, by the argument, backed up by what the Lord does, uh, obviously allows Jesus to press on further, which is what He does in the next paragraph. All right, let's keep moving then and go on over to Luke chapter 14. And the next section is verses 7 through 11. So Luke 14, verses 7 through 11. And he began speaking a parable to the invited guest when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them, 
When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. Someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this man. And then in disgrace you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you are invited, go and recline at the last place, so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So in the last paragraph, we had the Pharisees watching him closely, and now we find that this goes both ways, because we also find here that Jesus is watching them, and he sees how the invited guests have been picking out the places of honor at the table. Some of us have our uh, favorite places to sit, don't we? Whether it's at church or at home, at the dinner table or in the living room, we've got the chair or the place at the table, maybe at a restaurant. Usually we have some reason. Maybe there's no reason behind it. Some of us have a reason for sitting where we do. Um, but these people, they were looking for the places of honor. They were at this meal to be noticed. They wanted to be at the head table. They wanted to be near the host, the place of honor. Uh, some of us have heard about a, a guy who uh, visited a church that used to use a single cup for the Lord's Supper. I'm not sure what the, those groups are doing at this moment. Uh, but anyway, way back when, he shows up and there's one large goblet on the table at the front. And he's never experienced this before. He's a guest. And so uh, this is terrible in his mind. Germs, all that. And so he goes, he decides he'll sit at the front so that at least he'll be the first one to drink from it. Uh, after the prayer, though, those who are uh, serving actually start at the back, and he's actually the very last one to drink from it. But that's, that's just a terrible situation, isn't it? Especially with what we're going through right now. But I, I think we understand that all of us have our reasons for sitting where we do, and sometimes maybe we'll even get a little bit irritated if somebody gets our spot. At Cottage Cafe, I've got my spot at the counter. And I've sat there every Sunday morning at 6 in the morning for more than probably more than 10 years now. And I think if somebody were to beat me to it, I, I don't know. I, I might have a bad day. I, it's, I, I don't know what I might, to, I might do at that point. Uh, but at this dinner, Jesus notices people are maneuvering uh, for the seats of honor. And he uses this to teach a lesson. Instead of getting the good seat and being demoted by the host, he makes the point it's much better to start with the less desirable seat and then to get promoted by the host. Of course, uh, we understand this, how embarrassing it would be to be asked to move to a less desirable seat at a banquet. That'd be awful. But what an honor it would be to have the host personally invite you to move up to a better seat. That's the way to do it. Now, Jesus applies this spiritually in the same way. He says, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I was thinking about somebody who uh, likes their own post on social media. That happens sometimes, doesn't it? Uh, if I like my own post, I, I think I've heard it described years ago as giving myself a high five. That's not really, <laughs> that's not really the way to do it. You don't like your own post. Uh, it's not the same as somebody else uh, liking it or saying something complimentary about it. Praise and honor, we understand, means so much more when it comes from somebody else. And in the same way as God's people, we humble ourselves. We take the low seats uh, we do the things others might not want to do. And here we find God will reward us. He will lift us up at the proper time. But notice the Lord is not done. He continues here. So let's move on as well to Luke 14, verses 12 through 15. Luke 14, 12 through 15. And he also went on to say to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those who were reclining at the table with him heard this, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. So in addition to not going for the good seats, which he addresses to the guest, he now speaks to the host of this dinner. Uh, Jesus is an equal opportunity offender, isn't he? And the message to the host is, don't just in invite your rich and powerful friends to these dinners, but instead invite the poor, invite those who are unable to return the favor, invite those in need. If we only invite the rich and powerful, we end up getting repaid. 
but it's much better to invite those who cannot be repaid so that we are ultimately repaid not by people, but by God in the life to come. Obviously, we have not invited people into our home for quite some time now, but maybe we could ask ourselves tonight, how can we do something like this? How can we do what the Lord is talking about in this age of COVID? Uh, I really <laughs> can't invite you into my home right now. I mean, I, I could. If I were you, I wouldn't come. I hope that makes sense. But what can I do? What can we do? What can we do as a congregation? And more specifically, what can we do for others in a way that cannot be repaid? I would encourage all of us maybe to look through the church directory from time to time, try to brainstorm ways to help those who may be having a hard time right now. Uh, what if we mailed a, a gift card from Woodman's or Quick Trip or some place we know somebody goes? What if we could do a drive-by, the good kind of drive-by, where we say hello from the street in a safe way? We haven't had any congregation-wide fellowship op opportunities for obvious reasons uh, over the past few months. This is not the time to get together in the church basement and you know, share a meal shoulder to shoulder with 60 people down there like we sometimes do. This is not the time for that. But is there some way of doing that from a distance? Especially for our elderly members, for those who are at risk for various reasons. I don't know what the answer to that is. How to fellowship, how to talk to each other. I had one of our members call me today and it was an awesome experience. I hadn't heard his voice for so long. It's been five or six months since we've been together, it seems. I don't, you know, I don't even know. I'm losing track of time, it seems. But what can we do to maintain that connection and do what the Lord is talking about here? If you have any ideas, I mean, go for it. That's what the Christian faith is about, right? Um, if it's something more congregation-wide, if you need backup, if you need help, uh, get in touch with the elders. If there's something we might be able to do together in some safe way. I mean, we are looking for, for ways to, to get in touch with each other. Uh, our goal, based on this passage, is to do things for other people, not so they'll pay us back and return the honor, uh, but so that we can fill a need in a way that only God can pay us back in the life to come. This statement made such an impact that one of the guests just speaks up. Seems like he just blurts this out. It says in verse 15, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. And then this leads to what comes next. So let's keep moving then to Luke 14. Verses 16 through 24. Luke 14, 16 through 24. But he said to him, A man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land, and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife, and for that reason I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges, and compel them to come in, so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. First of all, most of us know what it's like to invite people over for dinner. I hope you know what that's like. It's, it's a great thing. Uh, there's some preparation involved, though. We know this. We typically clean the house, clean the bathroom, shop for food, then we get ready, we cook. Somewhere in there, we invite we ask people if they would like to come over. We send a text or an email. We make a call. We talk to them before or after worship. Remember, Jesus is at one of these dinners. So everybody knows what's going on here. This was done. We, we have all, and they have all, accepted an invitation. In the story, the invitation is giving. And notice the guests start making various excuses. Instead of just saying yes and coming to dinner, they, they talk their way out of it. And they're giving reasons as to why they cannot attend. They've bought land, and they need to look at it. They've bought oxen, they need to take them on a test drive. One just got married. Uh, I would point out the first two excuses sound a little bit made up, don't they? And the reason why I say that is this. Who buys land without looking at it? Have you ever bought land without looking at it? I have bought uh, several houses in my life up to this point. I've never bought a house without looking at it. Um, and then the same thing goes for, for oxen. You know, who would buy a car today without looking at it, without taking it on a test drive? We don't do that. And so as I look at the first two at least, 
they seem to be made up excuses. This does not seem realistic. They seem to be um, just excuses that don't make sense. Uh, things that they're just trying to say to try to get out of going to this banquet. Uh, the other one about being married, I don't, <laughs> I don't really know why that's an issue here, but this is thrown in as the number uh, three excuse here. So the slave who was sent out with the invites comes back, and he explains this to his master, and, and the head of the household gets angry. I think he can see through what's going on here. And so he says, you know, go invite everybody, open it up, everybody's welcome. And when that doesn't work, he sends him out again and tells him to compel people to come in. And so Jesus concludes with a reminder that those who gave excuses will never be let in. And what's a bit interesting is that Jesus really doesn't explain this parable, does he? There's no explanation given. He doesn't say, now as to the parable of the banquet, this is what it means. There's none of that here. Often he does give explanations, but not here. With this one, we're pretty much left on our own, but I'm sure we can figure it out, especially based on what comes next. It seems to me, though, that Jesus has to come first in our lives. No excuses. No excuses. Jesus comes first. We can't be making excuses. If we make excuses, we find here that the Lord, he moves on. He moves on to somebody else and keeps on looking for those who are willing. Most of you know by now that when I first started preaching, my dad encouraged me to keep a card in my middle desk drawer at the church office, and whenever somebody gives an excuse for not coming to worship, just write it down. And he said, you'll just, you'll appreciate that through the years, through the decades. If you keep on preaching for the rest of your life, you, you'll enjoy and get, you, you'll you learn something from looking back at some of those excuses. And, and I've done that. I did that the first summer that I moved to Wisconsin, down in Janesville, back in, uh, let's see, the summer of 92. My first sermon in Janesville was in 91. I lived there for the summer of 92, and I've done it since then, and, and I've had to staple another card or two to it, front and back, uh, added to the first one. And, and I'm not judging these excuses. That's not really my job as a preacher. That's between you and God, but it's amazing to me what people will tell the preacher, yeah, as if they need to explain, and I understand. You know, I, I check, and I, I hope you're okay, and that kind of thing. But it's interesting to look back at these through the years to see what we thought was so important to us at the time. And really looking back on it, maybe it wasn't. And and he's done the same thing through his life as a gospel preacher. One of his favorites, if I remember correctly, and uh, he can correct me on this. I'll check in with him later. Uh, but uh, somebody called him to let him know they wouldn't be at church that day because nobody in the family had any clean underwear. All right, well, that's an interesting excuse to begin with, isn't it? What's even more interesting is that you would call your preacher and tell him that. <laughs> All right, one of my favorites is when, or maybe not a it's hard to have a favorite excuse. I'd say maybe more intriguing or more interesting excuses was when one of our young couples called me, and it was on January 1st. Sunday was on January 1st, a number of years back, and they, they said, Baxter, um, we can't get our car out of our apartment parking lot because there are so many drunk people passed out in their cars and the cars are just randomly parked or abandoned all around their apartment building. So they were blocked in by passed out drunks on the southwest side of Madison. If I remember correctly, their apartment was uh, somewhere near the corner of Muirfield and Raymond Road down on the southwest side. Well, that's an interesting excuse. I mean, it's hard to kind of argue with that one. Uh, one of my favorites beyond that, uh, somebody <laughs> once called and let me know, I took a laxative last night and I just can't risk it today. That's a good one. That's very good, very interesting. Um, one family once called and said, um, our entire family can't come in today uh, because our dog ate an entire loaf of bread and we need to stay here and wait and see what happens. I bet that's... I Bet that was an interesting evening that they had. But, you know, all four had to stay there uh, to see what happens after a dog eats an entire loaf of bread. Uh, one woman called and said uh, they had ordered a load of dirt. And the only time the dirt man could come was 7 o'clock on a Wednesday evening. That's very, that's unique. That's the only time that that's happened on my uh, list of excuses. You know, there are many, many others, dozens of others that I've seen through the years, but Jesus gives some common excuses here, I think, doesn't he? Buying land, taking oxen out for a test drive, getting married, 
And looking at those three things that he gives, those are not bad things in and of themselves, are they? Those are not bad things to do. The problem is, these people in this story were using these everyday activities as excuses for not accepting the invitation to the dinner. And the problem is, they're not valuing the invitation. The invitation is not important to them. It's not a priority. What if I invite you over for dinner tomorrow night? Well, first of all, it's COVID and you shouldn't come. But under normal circumstances, if I were to invite you over and you say, oh, I would love to be there. Oh, but Thursday? That's the night I sweep my front porch. I, I don't think I can make it. What if I say, well, how about next Tuesday night? How about if you come over next Tuesday night? Mm, no, Tuesday, that's the night I clip my fingernails. I, I don't think I can make it to your house for dinner that night. I think I'd be getting a little concerned about that. I think there's something else going on there, and I think you understand what I'm saying there. And the same thing goes for the head of this household. If we blow off the invitation with a series of weak excuses, we demonstrate that what we're doing is more important than the relationship. And that's what Jesus is pointing out the danger of here. This leads us to the last paragraph. So let's keep going then to Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through the end of the chapter, 25 through 35 in Luke 14. Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, and wife, and children, and brothers, and sisters. Yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish? Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Therefore, salt is good. But even if salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So far in this chapter, Jesus has addressed the host. He has addressed the guest at the banquet. And now he turns to the crowds. He seems to have left the banquet. He's now back on the road. If you have a harmony of the Gospels, or it might say it in your regular copy of the Bible, you might notice most of this chapter most likely takes place in Perea. I had to look up where Perea is. Uh, Perea is on the east side of the Jordan River, pretty much between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, but on the other side of the Jordan, the east side. So Jesus is moving, he's traveling, and along the way he turns to the crowds. And he gets back to this idea of him being first. God comes first, even before our own families, he points out here. And in this context, he introduces the idea of hate. Obviously, we think of hate and we think about anger. We think of anger directed toward a particular person, toward somebody. And generally speaking, we are not to hate people. That's not a good thing to do. But here, hate is more of a comparison. We have two choices in terms of priorities. We might say that we love one and hate the other. Not an angry kind of hate, not specific toward a person. But the idea that one is far more important to us than the other. And that seems to be what we have here. God comes first before our families, even before our own lives, Jesus says. God comes first. And then he goes back and he says again that everybody must carry his own cross. We've seen this before in the gospel accounts. The cross continues to be one of the most painful, one of the most gruesome ways to die. And carrying the cross was a part of that punishment from the place of judgment to the place of execution. It was brutal, it was dramatic, it was meant to teach a lesson not just to the person dying, but to those who were watching. When we follow Jesus then, we are in the process of sacrificing ourselves. We are putting him first, we are not turning back. There's no going back if we're carrying a cross. And Jesus very clearly wants his disciples to know this 
ahead of time. He's not tricking people into following. He's not conning them, but he's letting them know the cost up front. He's warning them. This is what it means to be my disciples. And you need to know this sooner rather than later. Know the price before making any promises. Jesus then gives two examples, starting with the tower. And if you're thinking about building a tower, common sense hopefully tells you to sit down, calculate the cost before laying a foundation. Otherwise, you may get halfway done and run out of money. Then you'd be in an embarrassment. You know, the neighbors would look at you. It'd be humiliating. You'd be subject to ridicule. And we see this happen from time to time today. A builder starts building. The market collapses. Something happens. The builder gives up on the project. And it's a real waste because... A partially constructed building really isn't worth too much. Nobody wins in a situation like that. So here we are by this tower. Do we understand that building a tower like this must have taken some planning? There was some budgeting involved. There were meetings. There were architects involved. This didn't happen overnight. But instead, a lot of thought went into this. In the same way, we really need to have at least some concept of the cost involved before we obey the gospel. There's a chance that it's more expensive than we might realize. There is some sacrifice involved. I was reading earlier today about the eternal flame out in Arizona. There was a veterans group raised some money for a memorial. It was going to be a, an eternal flame. And as I remember the news story from a number of years ago, the city council said, okay, you pay for the memorial, we'll keep the flame going. That's our part of the ongoing part of this. And so great. It was dedicated Veterans Day or whatever it was, and a month later the bill comes in, and it was 960 something dollars for the first month of gas for the eternal flame. And the city council says, okay, that flame is not going to be quite as eternal as we said it was, and they turned it off. Well, they ended up, obviously, a lot of protest over that. They redesigned the monument, made a smaller flame, and got some donors and sponsors, and they were able to turn that back on. But there's an example of somebody not counting the cost before making a decision. Uh, the second illustration is different, but similar. Before going to battle, a wise king will also consider the cost. If he knows he can win, he goes to war. On the other hand, if he can see that he's on the losing end of a terribly lopsided battle, the wise king will try to work something out in some other way. He'll ask for terms of peace, he'll surrender. In the same way, we need to know the cost of following Jesus before we make that commitment. And in this case, at the end of verse 33, Jesus calls on his followers to do what? To give up all of their possessions. That is a huge commitment. In the last two verses, Jesus ends by comparing his followers to salt. We need to be salty. We need to have an influence on this world because if we don't, we're like salt that has lost its flavor. We are useless. The salt they had back then wasn't nearly as refined as what we have today. In most cases, it was very impure, uh, basically mixed in with dirt. You'd have more dirt than salt. If that happens, it was no good. You had to throw it away. There was nothing you could do about that. You can't fix unsalty salt. Well, we are the salt in this picture. We need to have the influence. We need to be pure in this world. Otherwise, we're about as useless as salt without flavor. I notice the Lord closes with a saying we mentioned in this past Sunday's lesson, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, if you are willing to listen to all of this, then you really need to be listening. And that brings us to the end of Luke chapter 14. Thank you for being with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Be sure to send me any prayer concerns. Use the contact information uh, on the screen or call me uh, so I can get those in the bulletin. Next week, let's come prepared for our next chapter by reading Luke chapter 15. Uh, the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Uh, let's close tonight with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God who has the power to heal. Uh, thank you for Luke, and thank you for preserving Luke's research into the life of your son. As we think about what we've learned, we allow our hearts to be changed by it. We pray that we might be more concerned about others than we are ourselves. We want to live in a way that we are rewarded, not in this life, but in the resurrection of the righteous. We pray that we would always put you first. Thank you, Father, for those who continue to work so hard in the medical field. Thank you for what we've learned about this virus over the past few months. Thank you for new developments, for treatments, for the research, for the testing that's ongoing and developing a vaccine. Thank you, Father, for negative test results. We continue to ask for ways to help others. Thank you for abundant resources. We want to do good and share because we know that with these sacrifices, you are pleased. We come to you with these requests, both thanking and praising you. In the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.